information here that Valeria ordered for us from the pulmonary foundation, uh, pulmonary fibrosis foundation. They're the only foundation that you should be looking for information on because they are the best group of people with accurate documentation on ILD, IPF. So there's tablets, there's brochures, and there's free pens, and these wonderful little bracelets for pulmonary, it says www.pulmonaryfibrosis.org, and these are really kind of, this is Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation on the other side. So these are really kind of cool things. So please come up and grab some of these on your way out. Yes? ILD is interstitial lung disease. IPF is interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. They're both um, similar but not. One you can medicate, one you can't. Uh, one has uh, different medications, the other one responds better to steroids and other things. So they're a little bit different, but they're really not good diseases to have. There isn't a good disease to have, except thyroid, you take a pill and forget about it. But there are very few things out there that uh, we're looking for. And, and fibrosis is so non represented um, by the community. There's very little information on it. So I run a foundation, I run a support group. On the second Tuesday, the second Monday of every month, for uh, pulmonary fibrosis ILD IPF support group, and it's really important to do this because these people need information. So uh, I'm working on that, and, and Valeria is really kind of on the cutting edge of um, pulmonary fibrosis, and she be all over the place on pulmonary fibrosis. And as you know, our Sarah isn't here today because she just had a lung transplant for her cystic fibrosis, double, doing fabulous. And so um, she sent me all her information. I'm gonna try my best to do a good job for her. So um, are we ready to get started? Does everybody need a little bit of a break? No? Okay, so I'm gonna have Valeria come up here with me. And um, please bear with me, because you know I lack computer skills, but they showed me this several times. <laughs> Volunteers who speak volunteer their time and efforts. So, no chit chatting. All you have to answer to me because I'm the speaker. And no cell phones. So, please turn them on vibrate and that kind of thing. So, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. So, Valeria here and I have been friends for quite a while. She's been a patient of ours for many, many years. She has IPF, ILD. Pulmonary fibrosis. And Valeria speaks all over the place on this issue. So she really is the ambassador for pulmonary fibrosis. So we're fortunate to have her here. So what we're going to do is we're going to speak, I'm going to speak on the Sarah part of cystic fibrosis, and we're going to compare the two. They're both not very good disease to have, like COPD or any other disease, but we want you to be aware of what's out there and what can be done for you, and the medications that are available to you now. Um, there's so much on the cutting edge that's coming out. And Valeria, I think, is waiting to get listed for a transplant. So. Okay, what are the diseases? CF. Sarah did it all fancy one at a time. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to advance. 
There we go. Okay. So what is the disease? Well, as you can see, CF is a, de it's a defective gene caused with thick, sticky buildup of mucus in the lungs. It clogs the airways and traps bacteria, leading to infections and extensive lung damage in the res and then respiratory failure. When Sarah had her surgery, the hardest part of her surgery, her surgeon said, is to get her lungs out of her body. That took the most amount of time while she was under having surgery because they were stuck in there. Why? Because they're sticky, thick, and overbearing. It's a genetic disease, meaning that you're born with it. And um, it, it's diagnosed, it's never really diagnosed immediately, but our Sarah was fortunate that she was diagnosed at three months old. Wow. A lot of times it's uh, not diagnosed right away and we call them asthmatics. And I think Joseph and I have treated a lot of these kids in the hospital um, thinking that they were asthmatics, but they weren't. They had cystic fibrosis and it really mimics a lot of the wheezing and sticky mucus and shortness of breath. So there's a lot of misdiagnosis that goes on with CF early on. And these are the bronchial tubes. They, as you can see, they look fairly normal on this side. And this one's sticky and ucky, full of mucus. So how can you get oxygen through those airways? And again, this is very similar to what you see in an asthmatic. Hello. Um, and I think there's a... Oh, there's another one. Yeah, one more. I'm sorry. There, there we, we go. go. Um, <clears throat> in pulmonary fibrosis, it, it too is also very often diagnosed as asthma, and I knew when the doctor gave me the medication for asthma, I, I wasn't that sh kind of short of breath. My operative word should have been that I'm short of breath on exertion. But that, as a patient, that's not a word I use all the time. So it took me a while, and then when pneumonia snatched me by the hair and sent me to the hospital, that was the start of the adventure that got me to where I am today. Um, <clears throat> when the doctor sent me home with oxygen, I'm like, what am I going to do with that? Because I wasn't short of breath all the time. For me, pulmonary fibrosis has taken a while for me to get here. For probably, I've been on oxygen for about 10 years. So, and I'm sure I had it before then. But here we are now, many years later. So anyway, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, scar tissue that builds up in the, sac the wall sacs of the lungs. And it does scar the lungs, making it hard for oxygen to get in your blood. Um, again, it develops over time. And <clears throat> I'm not sure if you guys can see how it, um, uh, it, it's a small um, illustration, but from what I understand from the surgeons that have looked at me, the, the fibrosis shrinks the lungs in addition to covering them. So the, the real estate that used to be where my lungs are is kind of shrunken up. So my stomach and my liver and my pancreas are just kind of floating around inside. <laughs> so <laughs> it, 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 was, it was a shocker to hear that, but you know, over time that's what it does for you. And it does make it hard to, um, hard to breathe. Hence this. And when I explain this to people like in the grocery store, because everybody assumes that see, I have COPD. And I don't have COPD. And they're like, oh, you can get those little cute small, I'm a big woman. I need big oxygen because I have a big disease. I love him. And it requires big oxygen. Hence, sidekick. Um, and then when their eyes start to roll in the back of their head, you know, they eventually get it because I explain it like there's a, a scar in your hand. It will heal up. But on the lungs, it doesn't heal up. It continues to spread. And they're like... Oh. <laughs> but it, it clears up a lot of things. You can go to the next slide.
Okay, what causes? And I'm going to let Jackie talk. I'll go all the way. Okay. Okay, back to CF, because we're comparing the two diseases here. Um, in CF, people with CF have inherited two copies of a de defective gene, one copy from each parent. Both parents must have at least one copy of this defective gene. So, obviously, Sarah has two siblings, two brothers, that are do not have cystic fibrosis, but both her parents carry the gene. There are more than 1,400 known mu um, mutations of this disease. Most genetic testing only screen for the most common CF um, mutation. Now, when you're dating and you see this really cute guy, you don't say, hey, let me stop you. The original. <laughs> and I I'll call you that. in a month. So love is love, and that's just how it works out. But unfortunately, there are genetic diseases out there. So um, Sarah's mom had two children after, after Sarah was diagnosed. And uh, they're a loving family, and that didn't stop them. So they're a very happy family. Unfortunately, Sarah was the one who ended up with the CF, and her two brothers are very healthy and doing very, very well, as well as our Sarah is doing right now. So, um, <clears throat> You know, I know it can be challenging to figure out what causes PF. Um, generally, it is called IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. That means they don't know why you have pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it's so funny because pulmonary fibrosis, and I just call it, I don't call it IPF, just pulmonary fibrosis in general, can affect different people in different ways across the board. There's some people that get it and they kind of fall off. They gotta have surgery immediately or they die immediately. And then there's people like me, still floating around, not doing everything that the doctor says. <laughs> but still I'm doing my thing. And we last a while. So then you don't know that in between. You just you just there because generally you're given a life uh, a lifespan of two to five years. Well, I'm past that, <laughs> gladly. Um, and, you know, PF can be caused by autoimmune diseases, occupational, and genetics. Mine was caused by autoimmune disease, I believe, because I have discoid lupus, not the regular lupus, but it affects your skin and your scalp. And mine has been very slow, which is part of why I think the PF hasn't progressed any faster. So I just get little lesions on my face and my scalp. Sometimes on my body, but not very often. So mine's kind of controlled, but <clears throat> you can get it from birds, hay, being in fields, navy yards. Um, Kurt, didn't Dan Buck have pulmonary fibrosis? No. I think he just had uh, uh, COPD, emphysema. I think he had pulmonary fibrosis he had pulmonary also, fibrosis. Yeah. and he had been in the Navy. And so sometimes you can get it from there. I mean, not everybody does, but those are just some examples of where you can get it from. And then genetics. I've known a family, a couple of families, in different pulmonary uh, support groups that I go to. A couple of family members, they, they had it. Two or three people have died from it. But it, not in my family, thankfully. And it really blew my mind. I'm like, where did I get this from? You know, my, my mother's 83. My father would have been 85, but he died at 82. And his mother lived to be 92. So I'm not expecting at 48 to get some fucky disease and die <laughs> within two to five years. My lifespan should be much longer. So. Yet here I am, still fighting the fight, every day. Okay. Who's next? Oh, back to Sia. Mm -hmm. Back to Sia. Symptoms. Okay, guys, this is my computer skill, so just bear with me. You're doing good. Okay. Hey, 
we're going to talk about the symptoms of CF. They vary. Um, sometimes uh, you have a salty taste on your forehead. It's kind of like licking up a table chip. And I remember as a student, and do you remember Joseph as a student? It's called the sweat test way, way back when. And I was in school way, way back when. And um, if, you, if you kiss the little baby, because I work pediatrics, I really didn't like it. But, because um, I always scratched and yelled at you. And, but if you kind of taste kiss them on the little forehead, they would be really, really salty. And that's a sign of cystic fibrosis. Who would have known? It's cheaper than running the test, but anyway. So they have salty skin. And that's why sometimes on Sarah's website, when she does things for the uh, CF Foundation, her name is Salty Sarah. And that, if you ever notice, it says Salty Sarah because CF patients are a little bit sulky. Um, they have a persistent cough with phlegm, uh, frequent lung infections, wheezing and shortness of breath, poor growth or uh, weight gain, and as you know, our Sarah is very, very, very thin, in spite of her great appetite, frequent greasy or bulky stools, or difficulty with bowel movements, clubbing of the fingers, Due to a lack of oxygen, CF has related diabetes. So I'm going to touch a little on these that I noticed in our Sarah while treating her, because she gave me permission to tell you everything. So no, I never licked her forehead, <laughs> but she did have a persistent cough, and you always heard her coughing, and sometimes you would even see me in the office beating her on the back, trying to help her with those secretions. She had a lot of secretions. Um, she had frequent lung infections and on a nebulizer three and four times a day. She did wheeze and she did have a shortness of breath. Eventually we put her on oxygen therapy, which really seemed to help with that whole uh, shortness of breath thing, which I kept saying, you need oxygen, you need oxygen, and she wouldn't listen. Um, that's part of being young. Um, <laughs> The first thing that they noticed when she was an infant, and this is what she shared with me, is the reason why her mother took her in is she had failure to thrive, meaning she was not gaining weight, she wasn't progressing like a three-month-old should be. Her weight should have been higher for that age group. And so since she had that failure to thrive, she brought her in and she says, and you want to kiss her? She's salty. And she was. She was tested for cystic fibrosis, and that's when she was diagnosed with the disease. She will, because she's had a transplant, she will still have cystic fibrosis. So she's still going to have issues with her gastrointestinal tract, but she just got a new release on life with new lungs. So the CF is going to stay with her, but she's not going to have that chronic cough anymore and producing sputum. The clubbing of the fingers, if you've ever noticed people who have oxygenation issues, their fingernails are kind of rounded. They're, it's called clubbing. And after she had her lung transplant, or before she had her lung transplant, I said to her, you know, Sarah, after your transplant, you know, sometimes the clubbing goes away. And then the other day she came out, she said, look at my nails, look at my nails. I said, oh, what a pretty color. She said, no, no, look at my nails. I go, oh. the clubbing is going down. So they're, they're starting to go back down, and she was so excited about that. She still has a sea of related diabetes and having to watch the diet that she eats. So uh, yes, we're gonna, we fixed her, but we put a band-aid on Sarah. She's still gonna have a lot of the issues that go along with cystic fibrosis, but this is a great start and a great lead to her uh, success. You know, she's a 26, 26 year old lady, a young girl who has the whole world ahead of her and hopefully uh, it's the, the funniest thing for Joseph and I to see with her is she sits in the office pre-transplant. We sat in the office and Joseph and I are almost naked because she has that freaking heater going. And she's always <laughs> cold. And then I'm saying, am I having a hot flash or is it your heater? And she always had this heater going. She's no longer cold. Hmm. And she no longer coughs. Huh. So you're looking at her and <clears throat> nothing, nothing. So it's really excited to see her progress in this way. Um, with pulmonary fibrosis patients, yeah, we have that cough too. Um, we have the shortness of breath, fatigue and weakness, discomfort in the chest. Um, for some people, yes. I mean, for me, the 
the cough, the shortness of breath, and the fatigue and weakness, especially at the end of the day, I'm like, oh my God, what truck hit me? And to my chair I go, and that's where I stay until the tiredness goes away. But um, no discomfort in the chest, thank goodness. Loss of appetite. Um, <laughs> a little bit, but not so much. It's getting better. Unexplained weight loss? For some people, not so much. And I don't have any clubbing of the fingers. But this is just a general for a lot of different patients. Um, thankfully, I haven't had a lot of these things, but um, the cough is it's just persistent. Thankfully, I've worked it down to where, um, you know, uh, oh, I forget the name of those, uh, those pills that the doctor gives you for the cough, Fisherman's Friend, Hot Water with Lemon, that helps. Tesalon Pearls, yes. That helps bite that cough back. Um, so, I, I think I do okay overall. Um, I still drive by myself. I haven't been in the hospital a lot. I haven't had a lot of um, exacerbations, and I don't know why. Um, I did go to the hospital in November, and one of the staff was like, I see you guys several times a year. You mean this is the first time you've been back in 10 years? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I'm you sure it's just what? I belong to Pep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't stay at home a lot. I mean, I try to get out there and enjoy life. Disneyland's not on my list anymore. It's just a bit much. But I try to have as much fun as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. What's the next oh, one? Put that picture there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, okay. she did it. She did okay. it there. Okay, we're going to go on. Oh, oh this one. This is kind of cute. Uh -huh. oh, oh, I got something for you. I love it. I'm going to share it with everyone. So I think the heart is giving oxygen to the lungs. Yes. So is that kind of cute? And it's a little O2. I don't know if everybody yeah. can see the little O2 that the blood is giving to the lungs. Yeah, that's kind of cool. <laughs> Need it. That's our Sarah. Okay, we're going to the next one. This is a treatment. Let me go all the way till I get to the end. Okay. 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 Oh, I think there's one more. One more quick. Oh, maybe another one. Oh, one more. <laughs> okay. Okay, now we're going to talk about the treatment for CF. Airway clearance. Obviously, that's a, a no-brainer. They have a lot of mucus. So airway clearance is really huge. That means chest therapy. You know, you saw me hitting on her back sometimes in the office. We have the vest. We have... Acapella, we have the flutter, we have a lot of devices to help you clear your sputum. So with CF patients, a lot of these mucus clearing devices were really invented for CF patients, but they work on people with COPD as well. Inhaled medications, bronchodilators, breathing treatments, those are all very important uh, aspect of her daily regimen of treating herself with CF or the CF patient. Vitamins, they lack a lot of uh, digestive issues, so they have a really poor absorption of vitamins and nutrition in their body. So vitamins are very important. Antibiotic therapy. Uh, if you have a gunk in your airways and it's ucky, it's bacteria. They have a lot of pseudomonas and different type of, I don't want to call it, but there's a lot of different type of bacteria and infections that they get. They're very fragile young patients. Uh, Anti-inflammatory medications, we know what those are, prednisone, inhaled steroids, good, I love steroids because they decrease the inflammation and make breathing easier. Supplemental oxygen, not all are on oxygen, but they get to the point where they need oxygen therapy. And with Sarah, we found out at the very end that she needed oxygen. She was on oxygen probably for about, what, two months prior to uh, having her transplant. It was heck to get it to her, but she did end up on oxygen therapy. And um, uh, pancreatic enzymes, she's on enzymes every day. So as this gal, this skinny little 90 or 88 pound young lady, she, like a truck driver, she was eating constantly in the office, grazing all day long, but could not keep that weight on because of her digestive issues that she had. 
lung transplant is the other uh, treatment for that, and we know that she had her transplant and is doing fabulous. But along with the transplant, what comes? She has a lot of anti-rejection medications. So she has a whole new set of issues that are going on, but she can breathe. And that's what's really excited about, exciting about the treatment for CF. And again, pulmonary rehab. So before you even have a lung transplant, you have to have pulmonary rehab pre, and you have to have pulmonary rehab post your transplant. So she, we already did her, her pre-pulmonary rehab, and then we did, we're just starting her, I think next week or the following week, she's coming back for her post-pulmonary rehab um, therapy. So you'll be seeing her in the gym. Um, it's very, very fragile. She'll be fragile for the rest of her life, but she was fragile prior to, do, to having some type of surgery. Um, <clears throat> for pulmonary fibrosis patients, the medications that are out there now, just within the last maybe four years, are, I'm going to call them by here. OFIP and Esprit. Yeah. OFIP and Esprit. Because the other names are like, <sighs> make my head yeah, spin. You don't need to know that. <laughs> right. So OFIP is an antifibrotic drug that's approved to treat IPF. Only IPF patients. If you just have pulmonary fibrosis with the connective tissue disorder like me, like I said, I'm, I have pulmonary fibrosis, but I also have discoid lupus. So if you have discoid lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, sarcoidosis, 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 what else? Um, let's see, there's sarcoidosis, um, lupus, yeah, lupus, scleroderma. Scleroderma, that's the one I'm looking for. Then you can't use. Esprit. You can't. Esprit or? Yeah, either, either of these diseases, but since I was on uh, OFEB. But they, they only did the clinical trials on people who just had IPF. Now, their reasoning is that for those of us with additional diseases, well, that'll just slow you down. Well, how about give us a double slowdown? I want to slow down. I want it to stop. And anything you can do to make it slow down even slower works for me. But they didn't ask me for my professional opinion. <laughs> so here we are. And Esbriet is also an antifibrotic opinion, I mean, um, antifibrotic anti-inflammatory drug. So it was approved for patients in, you know, US, Canada, Asia, Europe. So I guess they're both I can't take either one of them, no. so it's a new point, but it's out there. Um, there's good old prednisone, <laughs> everybody knows about that. Um, supplemental oxygen, lung transplantation, and pulmonary rehab. Personally, again, nobody asked me for my professional opinion, but I'm a patient. I think once you've been diagnosed with any one of these funky lung diseases, that you should go to a pulmonary rehab first. Just like when you get diagnosed with diabetes, you get to go to a, um, an endocrinologist, I guess? Yeah. You and you get everything you need, you name it. But when you get diagnosed with a disease that's eventually for real gonna kill you just like diabetes will, you get nothing. It's nothing for you. You might get an oxygen tank, you might not. But you're just out there languishing, trying to figure out which end is up with this crazy diagnosis of two to five years, thinking you're going to die. So at 48, that really sucked for me. And I'm like, I needed this back when I first got diagnosed. So there's the Esbriad. Um, there's really nothing else for you. out there that has been approved. Um, <clears throat> I used to take. Um, NAC and natal cysteine to help with the inflammation. Um, it's a naturally occurring thing in your body, but we don't make enough of it to really make a difference. So, but it's it's not bad to take. So I still take it on occasion, you know, to help try to keep the inflammation down. I also use a little bit of um, turmeric. Can't hurt you. Won't hurt. It's it's an an it is an anti-inflammatory. 
So I figure a little won't hurt. Helps those joints. <laughs> Might help the lungs also. Okay. That's it. That's it. We'll just work. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. We're going to talk about the outcomes and statistics. There's 30,000 people living with CF. Approximately 1,000 new cases diagnosed each year. More than 75% of these people are diagnosed by age two. So Sarah was very lucky that somebody recognized this so early in, in her life. More than half of the CF population are 18 years and older. Current life expectation, ex expectancy is only 37 years old. So this is why we really need to focus on this really nasty disease. These people deserve to live a full life like the rest of us here. So uh, this foundation, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, is a fabulous foundation. Uh, Mary Lou and I, and you guys sponsored Sarah once yep. on a uh, one of her little adventures, and it was a Mary and I, Mary Lou and I participated in a stair climb at Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl. Thank wow. you. And we had our choice, and you know I'm lazy. We had our choice to do 30,000 steps or 60,000 steps. So we chose the 30,000 step. I had just had a heart attack, so I didn't want to do the 60. But let me tell you, it was well worth doing. And we got these little trophies after these little medals, and we put them all around Sarah, and we walked in honor of her. Now, I think Joseph is going to participate. I'm just putting him on the spot. But in June, June 2nd, there's another cystic fibrosis walk in uh, Santa Monica that we're all going to do as well to participate with Sarah and I don't know if Sarah's going to walk it. I don't know if she's strong enough. Sure, her lungs are, but um, her legs are like little bird legs right now if you've seen her. But we're going to walk in honor of Sarah on the next uh, cystic, fibro uh, cystic Fibrosis Foundation walk. So it's really important to, for us um, to, because I know her and I work right next to her, um, I feel honored to walk in her honor um, and walk for those who can't. Uh, even though I have a bum leg, it's okay. <laughs> My lungs are good. But it's important to participate and look at these foundations as well. It's a pulmonary found, uh, fibrosis foundation to support these people because they're doing research to help find a cure for these diseases. So um, pulmonary fibrosis I know you guys probably never heard of it before now, and I had never heard of it myself. So when this doctor was like, you have this drug, this disease, it's called this, and you have two to five years to live, I'm like, what are you talking, who are you talking to? You're gonna be talking to somebody behind me, and I'm, my father and I are the only ones in the room. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it affects 100,000 people in the United States. So for, for a disease that nobody's ever heard of, it sure is affecting a whole lot of people out there. And that's just in the United States. So there's worldwide, okay, so I'm skipping one, but it affects 13 to 20. Okay, so out of 100,000 people, I got too much to say in one mouth. The Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation has a summit every couple of years, and there's people from all over the United States and globally, Brazil, Ireland, India, Europe, you name it, these people are there. So, for, like I said, for some disease that nobody's ever heard of, it affects so many people and it's just, it just makes my head spin. Um, 30 to 40,000 new cases are diagnosed each year. Each year? And nobody's ever heard of it? That, again, it just amazes me. So, I'm not in a position to put together, I don't think, a run or like a, uh, we need to have pulmonary fibrosis, I feel like needs to be as big as breast cancer. The runs, the walks. I agree. I don't know how to make it that big. I'm just saying that's what it needs to be. So, again, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation has a wealth of information on its website if ever you decide you got a little free time, you want to go look around, see what's happening. They are the nicest people. They give away swag. Um, 
but I, I work as an um, ambassador sometimes, though I'm not flying anymore. And so I go around the, around, uh, the states talking about my story when there's a conference or something like that. So I invite you guys to come get this, go to the website, and now you've heard of pulmonary fibrosis. Is there anything else? Fun facts. This one has your baby in it. So in this terrible disease, there's some fun facts here that I just wanted to share, Sarah wanted to share with you. Cystic fibrosis is often called the 65 roses by children who can't pronounce the disease. So instead of saying cystic fibrosis, they say 65 roses. And so it's kind of stuck with the foundation, and so it's called the 65 roses disease. So I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, the C, uh, CF holds all types of fundraisers and race money, uh, like the bike rides, stair climb, which Mary Lou and I did, and the walks, comedy shows, and a flip cup tournament, which I don't know what the flip cup tournament, I think it's probably golf. It's a drinking game. Oh, is <laughs> Wow! They are fun people. Okay. I'll have to ask Sarah more questions about that one. CFers, though, can never be around others due to the contagious bacteria in their lung. So, and it's interesting because Sarah will say, I just talked I just talked to one of my friends. Well, you know, when you talk to her friend, we say, hey, how are you? What's going on? They don't. They do not. They never, they know about each other, but they're never together because they're contagious and they can get their bacteria. So they always email, and she's always on texting and emailing. That's how the people with cystic fibrosis uh, communicate. And I had no idea, this is all kind of new to me too, that um, they carry uh, bacteria in their lungs. I knew they had bacteria, but I didn't think it was contagious and it, it can actually be deadly towards others. Yes? I just want to mention we're contagious to other CF patients. I'm sorry? We're contagious to other CF yes. patients. Yes. Like, I've got a 10-year-old daughter. I've never made her sick. Wow, just to other yeah. CF patients. Yes. Right, so she can hang out with us and we're fine, but other CF patients she cannot be around. Which was really an eye-opener to Mary Lou and I when we went to this walk. Um, she, Sarah was there with us because she was one of the head people who raised money for the, because of us. Um, but there was another young man, and Sarah constantly, we were moving over here, and when he was coming, we were moving over here. I'm thinking, why are we doing this dance? And then she says, because he, he's a CF patient, and we can't be around each other. Even though they share something in common, they share a disease, they do not want to share bacteria. Hmm. So I found that very, very interesting. So again, it's the 65 roses. I thought that was really cute. Um, with pulmonary fibrosis, you know, when I'm start speaking to somebody else who has pulmonary fibrosis, I use PF instead of the regular spelling of a word uh, phonetically. I learned that huh, pulmonary fibrosis lungs sound like Velcro when heard through a stethoscope. That blew my mind. I, I just couldn't believe it. I've never heard it, but. The thought of that is just, <laughs> and um, the pulmonary fibrosis does a lot of fundraising. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, like blue nails and hair for for awareness in the month of September because that is pulmonary fibrosis awareness month. So you know we put I put I'm not gonna dye my hair but I'm gonna put blue pieces in or do I hair, my nails blue and green, um, for the awareness. And I put this picture of my granddaughter when she was little. All she's known is me on oxygen. And so she picks up my cannula from some point and puts it up to her nose. Aww. And I'm thinking, do I laugh or do I cry? It's super cute, but it's precious. Oh, it is precious. That's where I'm going to leave it because I don't want to cry. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything else. I don't Let's see if there's anything else. 
Thank you from Sarah, and she misses all of you. And thank you, Valeria, for enlightening us on this disease. Is there any questions, or do you want to ask anything? Yes. According to Sarah, they're just not allowed to be together, and they know that. So they just, is that right? Yeah, for example, when I go to the doctor, if I'm sitting in the waiting room, I have a mask on, and if another CF patient comes in, they have a mask on, but they will remove one of us right. from the room. Wow. Uh, and the mask the room? Sarah wasn't feeling well one day, and I said, you call your doctor and get into the clinic regardless. And she says, it's CF day, I can't go. I mean, I, I can't go because it's CF day. Wow. So there's other CF patients. So she has to make sure, and you're right, you can't be in the room with another CF patient, which was an eye-opener to me too, also, because I'm not the expert on CF. I know everything about COPD, but this is something new to us, and I'm excited about it because it's always nice to learn. But good question. Yes? Are there many undiagnosed CF or patients wandering around that nobody knows about? Probably. Especially the way medicine's going these days. <laughs> probably. It's probably mistaken as asthma or, wow, that's a really brittle asthmatic, but maybe they don't have asthma. So um, my, my suggestion is if you know anybody who's sick like this, get them to see a pulmonologist. Have them have a workup. Yes. Yes? Sorry, not that I'm the expert. No, no, you <coughs> are. You have CF. Um, you have but when I was diagnosed, I got genetic testing because I was going to be trying to have a baby. And so I went for the testing, and I came up with a mutation. And they thought, well, yes, it is on the CF marker, but we don't think this is true CF. And that's because... Now they said that there's, she said there's 1,700 different types. Different types. There were 300 when I was diagnosed. Wow. Okay. And I'm 45, and there's another patient that goes to my doctor, and he's in his 60s. Wow. So there's well, a ton of different yeah, so it's, types yeah. of it now. Thank you for sharing So I think that. there's probably many, many people that have not been diagnosed. That have been diagnosed. Wow. Wow. I encourage people to see pulmonologists because that's their expertise. They know about the lungs. They do pulmonary function tests. Um, your GPs are fabulous people. Uh, I have a great um, GP. However, you know you don't go to your um, you don't want your GP delivering. You don't want your pulmonologist delivering your baby. So go to the people that know and specialize in certain things. And so I prefer to go to a pulmonologist if you have a pulmonary issues or something in your lung going on, because they're the experts. That's what all they do. All they see is lungs. And she's right. When we listen to your lungs, Joseph and I, because we evaluate everybody when they're in rehab, there is a distinct breath sounds in people with pulmonary fibrosis. It sounds like Velcro. <coughs> like you get two pieces of Velcro and you pull it apart. They're called rolls, and they're really distinct on the bottom. And it's not always IPF, but other disease, ILD, um, um, sarcoidosis, um, pump, sometimes it's a fluid overload and you have rolls down there. So it doesn't mean you have IPF, but it's a distinct sound. So when somebody, so we have students or something, and somebody has some beautiful rolls, you got to come over here and listen to these breast sounds, because you really don't hear them all that often. And you say, listen, listen to them, and listen to them on the bottom. And they say, wow, what's that? And I said, those are rolls. That's what you hear when people have pulmonary fibrosis. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Let's give our two lovely speakers a, a warm round of applause. Great, great speakers. Thanks, everybody. I'd like to make an announcement also. Uh, some of you know that I sing. That's my joy. And uh, my chorus, barbershop chorus, puts on a show every year. And it's always a farce. It's always funny. And uh, we did Titanic the musical. And we did Casablanca, the musical. Well, this is Scarface, the musical. And it's all back in the 20s, and speakeasies, and prohibition, and all that stuff, and uh, a lot of fun. It's all on these cards. So anybody who's interested, it's two weekends in June. 
the second and third weekend of June. There's a Saturday night show and a Sunday afternoon show. And the last the last show on sun, this, the final Sunday afternoon is already sold out. So if you want any more Take information, he's got some cards on it. Okay. So everybody, thanks so much for coming to the lunch. Uh, drive home safely, and God bless you all, and I'll see you at happy hour and exercise on Friday. And if you haven't been to exercise lately, you're missing the boat. Oh, there's no cookies.